Yeah. Are we good to go? You're hitting the hard stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So are we live or come? We are live. Okay. So hello and good evening everyone. Welcome to today's BBM talk session, Bonding with Butterflies. Uh, this session has been organized by NatureMates and Lepidigi.net. Uh, today's session is going to be an exciting one as we are honored to have Mr. Peter Bygett with us. And he has been an explorer and a world explorer, uh, a naturalist. And uh, he since 2007, he has uh, visited India for nine times. And uh, so to enjoy his talk, uh, I would request everyone to uh, mute their audio and turn off their video. So now I will request Mr. Mr. Arjun Basurai, uh, Secretary of Nature Mates Nature Club, to introduce him formally, as he has been his travel partner since the very beginning. So Arjun Da, over to you. Hello. So it's an honor to introduce Peter, who is a very good friend of mine, exactly the age of my father. Though we have traveled in various part of India looking for butterflies since 2014, 13, 14. I am very lucky that I have been with them in the field in, in our place and have learned so many things in, uh, in India from this elite group where Peter, Adrian, Tony, Nigel and Pam and many others are there. So I have learned a lot of things from them. I have learned that you know, for butterflies, how much, how far people can go and how passionate they can be without any sort of look. Well, we do butterflying for many reasons, but this set of people whom I'm talking about, like Peter and Adrian and his friends, they love butterfly, that's the only thing. And they, for their love for butterfly, they have traveled the world. So now it's over to Peter, who will take us through India with our butterflies and his feelings. Yeah. Bam. <laughs> Over to you, Peter. So my shared screen. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's good to see you all, and it's um, a pleasure to be here. It's very kind of you to describe me as a naturalist. Um, I'm actually generously described as a naturalist because I'm just a lucky amateur, uh, certainly not a scientist. Um, and as far as being an explorer is concerned, I'm more like a kid <laughs> than anything else. So what I'm going to do in the next hour is run through some uh, illustrated butterfly stories um, and I shall uh, in, intertwine that with some travelers tales, uh, and end up with a few more butterfly stories and I think at the end um, I may be right in saying that um, uh, I can take a few questions as long as they're perhaps not too technical. So Let's get started. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, right. <laughs> um, I, I, I think before I get stuck in, uh, I think I need to put this whole subject of butterflies into some kind of context. And first of all, the context for me as a foreign visitor uh, to India um, has got to include all the cultural aspects, the rich, deep history of the country, its religions, its various architecture, the colors and the movement, the uh, 
endless vehicle horns that you hear when you're on the road. The little streams of kids turning out in the morning, somehow in immaculate school uniforms. A country with stunning scenery. Um, if anybody's ever travelled on Indian railways, you know that's an experience uh, in its own way. There's a fantastic sense of hospitality and a perpetual humour. Uh, and it's certainly very humbling for a Westerner to experience a different sort of humanity. And yet there's so much more to India. And into this context has come, as, as Arjan was saying, a small group of aging <laughs> butterfly photographers. Um, uh, trips with certainly an element of exploration, adventure, and some risk, even potential danger. And with all of that, you've got the ingredients for some lifelong memories. And it's some of these that I want to share with you now uh, from much happier times than we're all enduring today. So here we go, some butterfly tales from India. The first, there is a harsh reality for us all to face. And that is the, the loss of habitat on a relentless, massive scale throughout the entire world, threatening every living thing on the planet, including ourselves. But enough of that, let's get into the butterflies. So the first butterfly that came to my mind is the Blue Mormon, Papilio Polymnesta. And I got this photograph in China, in Kerala. But the tale started eight years before that, when I was in Kerala uh, with my wife on a holiday. And we were staying at Mararikulam on the coast. And the particular hotel had a, um, a vegetable and a, a butterfly garden. And whilst I was in there one evening, this huge blue butterfly <laughs> came through, stopping for a nanosecond to take nectar from a red hibiscus. And it, it was so fast in its movement that I couldn't even get a, a photograph and away it went. But about 10 minutes later, it came back again and visited the red hibiscus again for a, for a nanosecond and moved on to another flower. And I still couldn't get a photograph. And about 10 minutes later, it came round again. It was clearly doing some kind of circuit, but for the life of me, I couldn't get a photo. So the Blue Mormon became the butterfly in India that I just had to photograph. And I managed that uh, with Arjan and others on a wonderful trip uh, in 2015. In a similar way, the Bhutan glory, which is one of the butterfly wonders of the world, uh, a rare butterfly, here seen two of them, taking minerals from a stream running at the side of the road. They were actually in the water, uh, in the Eagle Nest Wildlife Sanctuary, um, up in, uh, I guess, the Himalayan foothills in Arunachal Pradesh. Although getting there, was another tale. There was a big storm at Eagle Nest. On our way there, we were in two vehicles and we took from a, uh, uh, the um, checkpoint at Ramalingam, we took the rough track in torrential rain and gale force winds in fading evening light 
We passed through at one point an active rockfall. And Arjan jumped out of the car, and so did I in the pouring rain, to throw rocks away so that the vehicle could get through. And I jumped back in, and the vehicle behind, I was really worried that it wasn't going to get through, because on the left-hand side, it was just a sheer drop. But when I talk about a big storm, of course, I'm talking about a big storm by English standards. I'm not talking about cyclones or hurricanes. But it was so bad that at about half past one in the morning, with my tent about to take off, I actually got out of my camp bed and I got dressed. I got my passport, I got my wallet and my phone because I thought that's all I was going to be left with. Anyway, we all made it through. I think Arjan was more concerned about the rat that was in his tent <laughs> uh, than I was. Anyway, in the morning, the photograph of the rain, misty clouds over the valleys below, um, below Lama camp uh, were plain for all to see. So very dramatic. But there's some other places in India that um, immediately come to mind. Um, the first one, the Banya River, photographed here off the road bridge at Chilapata. I think that's West Bengal. Um, it's memorable because it really was the first sight on that particular trip. Um, I think my first trip with Arjan, where I actually got down to the riverside and the butterflies were there. And there were butterflies nectaring on the blossom on the trees you can see on the right. Um, very, very memorable. And photograph number two is of the Jayanti River with Bhutan in the background. And this was part of the, um, uh, the Buxa, or perhaps the Manas, I can't quite remember. I think the Manas um, uh, Tiger Reserve. And then the third it's, one. It's Buxa, Buxa Tiger Reserve. Buxa, I was right first time. <laughs> um, I thought I'd done all my homework, but obviously, yeah. <laughs> And then the third photograph is of the Brahmaputra floodplain um, from the Mishmi Hills in uh, Arunachal Pradesh. Um, oh, um, absolutely fantastic habitat. And it's also really memorable in the sense that if you look at that vast Brahmaputra floodplain, you can't see a single building on it. I wonder how long that will stay the case. On this very first trip, I had a, an experience that I, I, I found hard to believe because we were up in Sikkim, um, high, in the, high in the mountains at Yuxum. And the bottom right photograph is little brown butterfly was up down on the ground. And it was fussing about taking minerals and it turned round through 180 degrees. And as it did so, it changed color. The golden sapphire. There are several sapphires and they all do the same thing. There is the blue sapphire, the azure sapphire, the naga sapphire, and some others too. And they all do the same thing, a wonderful little family of butterflies. Um, and here's another second time lucky story uh, with a, a common butterfly. Um, but I'd first of all seen it on a trip with some other guys to Sri Lanka. And I'd managed to grab a photograph as it flew through, landed on a flower, and departed almost straight away. 
This time, we were in Mudumalai in Tamil Nadu, 2017. And it was early morning and the butterfly was roosting. It hadn't actually flown. And I thought, well, I'm going to wait for it to open its wings. So I stood there with my camera for more than 20 minutes waiting for it to do something. <laughs> Eventually it did. It slowly opened its wings, as you can see. And I got my photo. And as the sun came up, it went. So patience, certainly a virtue. And here's another nice story, again from just down the road from uh, Eagle Nest. Um, one of Arjun's team, I don't remember if it was Sarika, Tarun or Deep, uh, but one of them had said they'd seen the sorrel sapphire just down the road on its food plant, the, 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 the pink sorrel. And so we went down to this particular spot. It was a big rock, a big outcrop with the sorrel growing on it. And we searched and searched and didn't see anything. And then eventually one came into view, but it was very old and worn and weary and tattered. But at least we'd seen one. Anyway, the next day we went back down there again and just checked it out. And there was a new hatch and this wonderful little butterfly sitting on its host plant. Um, it's a most memorable um, event. And I'm described as a, as a naturalist. Well, wildlife in general is something that I really love seeing. And here is a little break from butterflies. We have a Okay, so am I unmuted now? Yeah, 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 you're, you're audible. Okay, because I've just had a little sign come up saying that I, I, was, I was muted. Um, do I need to go back, anybody? No, no, you, you can proceed. I can proceed, okay, okay. I don't know how that happened. Um, Yes, down by the roadside at uh, Ultapani. Um, a nice family of golden langos came in to see what we were doing. Okay, there's something going on here. Um, okay. Another butterfly I'd like to just tell you about is this small skipper, the orange-tailed awl. Arjan was very keen for us to get up whilst it was still dark one morning. Um, and uh, the idea was to go and see, see if we could find one of these little butterflies that buzz around the, the base of buildings in the small hours, both in the evening and at first light. Um, and eventually we found one and it was really difficult to photograph because as soon as we got close to it, it would zoom off somewhere. But uh, yeah, the orange tail all, a wonderful little butterfly, great personality. Um, and we started the day well. It was a long day, as I recall. The Kalek River in Sikkim. Um, high up in the mountains. Lots of butterflies taking mineral salts down by the river. And I took these photographs and thought that I'd actually taken photo, two photographs of the same butterfly until it was pointed out to me that actually, no, they're two different butterflies. 
the top one being the spectacle sword tail, and the one below being the six bar sword tail. And if you look at the um, this line, I don't know if my cursor is showing on the presentation, uh, the, this line is different. There's the spectacles on the spectacle swallow tail, and the six bars are not where I've just shown you, they're elsewhere. So, uh, uh, very good to have that pointed out to me. The Nam Dafa Tiger Reserve in uh, Arunachal Pradesh, um, a wonderful, wonderful venue. Um, very exciting place to be um, near the town of Namdafa. But this was one of the occasions when disaster hit our group. It was on the second or third day of the trip. Uh, one of the group slipped into a, a drainage gully and gashed his leg, had to be taken away to hospital. And although we did see him later, um, he, uh, he had a really bad time and of course it cast a real dampener uh, on the rest of the group. We crossed over the river Nonadihing uh, on elephants and you can see from these two that the current is strong but sitting on the back of my elephant I wasn't sure once or twice whether it was going to stay on its feet it was an incredibly strong current that was flowing that day. But on the other side, we had a chance encounter. In the forests, sometimes these things just happen. Uh, up in the forest, one of the group um, spotted the butterfly high up in a tree um, and said, uh, that he thought it was a tailed labyrinth. It may well have been Arjan that spotted it. And so we're all gazing up at this tree and none of us could see this tailed labyrinth. Until one of the group said, oh yeah, I can see it. Is it that sort of grey brown thing up there? No, <laughs> it's not. A... That's a Koh-i-Noor. A great rarity. It was up there taking sap from from the, from the tree. The uh, the tail labyrinth isn't exactly a, a common butterfly either. So that was a great experience. The way things just happen. Serendipity, I think it's called. And we had another great experience once again at Altapani, where the road was being built through and bridges were being constructed in advance of that. And all of these butterflies that you see here, quite large butterflies, they typically sit with their wings closed. So it's very uncommon to find them sitting with their wings open. But on this particular day, uh, towards the end of the day, sort of mid to late afternoon, we were walking back or probably just visiting the site again. And on all the bushes around this particular bridge, all of these butterflies were just sitting there with their wings open, not batting an eyelid. Just quite, a, quite an incredible experience. It was just species after species that we had longed to see sitting like this. And there they all were, just, just waiting for us. In a similar sort of way, although I suppose quite different in that they were on the move all the time, the Malabar tree nymph, a large black and white butterfly. Uh, I'd seen it again, first of all, in, um, in Sri Lanka, although not this particular species. Um, but we have a video, which I will show you, a short video Here we go. You can hear the cameras clicking and the birds singing.
There we are. So you can see I'm not a great video uh, <laughs> recorder. Um, but there were scores of them there. Um, uh, when I say scores, I'm certainly saying m many more than 20. Uh, they were all fluttering around their um, host plant uh, on, on which their caterpillars feed. Oh, I'm showing you the video again unintentionally. <laughs> I'm just checking the time as well. Right, so good, I showed it to you twice. <laughs> and then there was another occasion, um, this in, again, on the Kerala trip, where the, well, we, I, I used to call it the Southern Birdwing, but I see it's now being called the Syadri Birdwing. We watched this female wanting to come down to lay an egg on, on the bush. And she was circling and going away and coming back. And eventually, as we waited patiently, she landed and laid an egg. And straight away, one of our group went in to take this macro photo. And instantly, we noticed that the parasitic wasp was on the egg. The egg was already doomed to become another bird wing. But we wondered whether what we'd seen was a scientific first, because how did the, the wasp get there so quickly, so instantly? We only concluded that either it was already waiting on the bush, on the leaf, uh, in anticipation of a butterfly coming in, or else being so small, perhaps it just catch the lift on the hairs on the body of the female. And as soon as the egg was laid, the wasp was there. I don't know if it is a scientific first, um, but certainly I think quite a, a unique experience for us all. So I'm going to intersperse the butterfly stories with some some traveler's tales. And when you're, as a traveler, um, off the beaten track, away from the tourists, um, looking at the ground very often to see what you can see, uh, a sudden encounter with forest elephants in Buxa was something that scared the living daylights out of all of us. Because these things, these elephants, move through the forest without making a sound. And we were right at the road edge, and these elephants were probably no more than 10 meters away. They were suddenly there. So you can imagine we were all in the vehicles as quick as we could get um, to, uh, to move to safety. And uh, there was a, a moment when we were at Kaziranga in Assam, when the little open top Jeep we were in broke down. This was on the opening day of the Kaziranga reserve. So there we are, standing by this Jeep with its broken engine, and elephants in the river just down from us. We didn't really want to uh, sort of be there. We wanted to be out of the way before the elephants came. And there was another discomfort moment at Kaziranga when we were going up into the forest across from the marshy reserve. And our local guides were absolutely petrified in case elephants should come between us that they should cross the path below us uh, and be between us and the safety of the road. 
um, this was a nice habitat and we Westerners were a little bit cheesed off that we couldn't stay longer but uh, you've got to listen to the locals but the real panic and I noticed Pam earlier in one of the pictures uh, Pam was with us at Jaipur Forest um, and we'd had our lunch and walked up I'd walked up the track and uh, I was probably a couple of hundred yards from the vehicles which by now were out of sight and all of a sudden to my left between the track and the river there's this great crash and as I looked down I saw an elephant and the elephant was probably 20 yards away um, and I don't think the elephant had seen me although probably had anyway I very quickly turned on my heel and walked briskly back towards the car but the elephant was walking in the same direction more quickly than me as I came around the corner I shouted to everybody else elephant Arjan told me to run and I passed Pam who could, didn't give a hoot <laughs> I think I think I would have beaten Usain Bolt that day I've never seen two vehicles turn around through 180 degrees so fast we waited for Pam um, Pam said that uh, uh, elephants wouldn't trouble her she was very philosophical but for a moment that was real panic stations because the elephant actually had a calf with her um, and as you know mothers and calves <laughs> are dangerous but at least there was time for me to get this photograph of the small beautiful chocolate royal um, I point out on this butterfly that the wavy tails at the back of the butterfly uh, are, are moving continuously they're twitching and moving uh, and they do that in order to distract a potential predator from taking a peck at the other end which of course is where the butterfly's head is so it's quite often that you see these type of butterflies with their back ends missing but at least they've lived to fly another day and we had a different kind of excitement as well one time when we were in Nagaland and we learned at very short notice that Assam which is where we were going the next state was going to um, be in lockdown complete lockdown uh, and that, uh, a statewide strike known as a bund and no travelers can take to the road during a bund but we wanted to or we had to get into um, a sam there were some of the group who were due to fly out um, so arjan organized um, escorts for our vehicles and the first escort which isn't photographed here was a khaki dressed um, police with rifles who led us at great speed <laughs> uh, literally on deserted roads uh, to the edge of Jorhat where it looked like the fire brigade uh, and also some police um, escorted us through the city um, again we were going incredibly fast much much faster than one would normally expect and once we were through the city our final group shown here on the bottom left um, they looked more like sailors but i think they were police in a from a different outfit uh, with their rifles they led us out of jorhat into a sam and after maybe 20 minutes waved us past it was safe to go so um yeah an exciting time no danger but um exciting and kind of unique experience and another 
delicate moment happened in zero uh, where on a very very muddy track on my own I encountered another cow uh, one of the mitun which for those of you that don't know is a cross between the wild gaur and the domestic cow and they are built like tanks they're supposed to have a soft gentle nature but this one had her calf and as i came around a bend in the track um i think she was as surprised as i was she had nowhere to go i didn't particularly want to go back and on the right side of the track there was the infestation of leeches and i I'd already been leached and blooded and I didn't want to be leached and blooded again. So I inched my way past the cow and she was probably only, only four or five meters away from me. And as I walked past, she took a step forward and snorted a real snort get out of my way type of snort <laughs> and so i did but she left me alone and i didn't get reached either so back to some butterflies um four or five butterflies that i'd just like to tell you about this one was taken um in March, uh, early season um, near Konoma in Nagaland, uh, when I was on a special trip uh, with our Jan and my middle daughter Charlotte, uh, and the the red lace wings were were out, and I decided that the underside, which I'm showing you in this photograph. It's just as beautiful as the upper side um, and uh, so when I see this butterfly uh, and indeed when I see all the photographs I know exactly where they were taken uh, when they were taken who I was with and what the context was now this one the clipper a fantastic nymphalid butterfly a very powerful flyer uh, this one was taken at uh, chikodi or chikod in kerala and it was very much a uh, a grab shot because the big butterfly it was very impatient yeah, it was moving around all the time but i managed to get a a decent shot of it um, as it landed for a moment um, on a bush. Now we're back now at Nam Dafa uh, across the Nondehing River and this is a fantastic butterfly. It's a medium to large butterfly uh, with attitude. So as we crossed over the river on our elephants and got off the elephants and walked towards the forest at the forest edge this butterfly was sitting up on a tree, checking us out. And when I say checking us out, it was checking us out. It actually flew, it flew around my head. It actually went back up onto the tree and looked at us and it flew back again and it hit me on the head as if to say, hey, what are you doing here? This is my patch. <laughs> um, eventually, it settled on the ground and it's one of these butterflies with wonderful iridescent blue um, blue scales on its wings as you can see here uh, absolutely fantastic butterfly and definitely a butterfly with attitude in a different sort of way completely um, this little butterfly uh, this was another second time lucky butterfly i'd seen it again in sri lanka 
um, but uh, uh, it was um, very badly damaged um, late season up on the Horson Plains. And I long to see it again. And it's a common butterfly. So, you know, it's not a, not a big deal, but it's a wonderful little butterfly. And I'm particularly fascinated by the nature of the red band on, on the hind wing. Um, because it's, it, it's, it, it's a partial red band breaking up the normal black band. And I, I just think it's a, uh, it's a fascinating, it's a fascinating color scheme, say no more than that. I showed you the saw to the um, saw tails from, uh, from Sikkim. Amongst them are these wonderful sawtooth with their swept back, uh, swept back forewings and wonderful color schemes. Uh, very memorable and very often you see them in great groups, great clouds of them, along with other members of the whites. So that finishes my Indian butterflies. And I've been asked to show a few non-Indian butterflies. So the first one I thought I'd show you was uh, one from my garden at home. Uh, it's a common butterfly, but I think it ranks as amongst one of the world's most beautiful butterflies, uh, the peacock. Uh, this particular species will live, if its luck is in, for the best part of a year. So it will hatch from its chrysalis in July. It will go through the rest of the summer. It will spend the winter hibernating in a shed or a wood pile, a log pile, it will come out in the spring and it will then mate and the female will lay the eggs often as late as May. Um, the wonderful butterfly, beautiful butterfly. One of only 59 in the UK. Much more difficult is to choose Africa. And top of the pile has to be the amazing giant African swallowtail, Papilio antimacus seen here in the Nimba Hills in Liberia. Um, the Nimba Hills are probably no longer there. They are an iron ore deposit of great magnitude. And the firm ArcelorMittal is removing the mountains, uh, but was doing some very good conservation work beforehand um, and we were there um, before they got started. But the giant African swallowtail, even though it is the largest African butterfly with a wingspan of up to nine inches, 23 centimeters, its biology is unknown in that it is not known what its food plant is for its caterpillars, um, and we hoped to see it, and indeed, as you can see from the photos, we did. It was typical in that it was on the last day uh, of going back to a, a hilltop site um, where we would hope to see it. One eventually came in and settled on the top of a tree. And the story of the giant African swallowtail is that it's female, uh, that's a male shown here. The female, unusually in butterflies, is smaller than the male. And it is known that the male will sit on top of its tree, looking out over the rainforest canopy until it spots a female, when it will dash off and start its courtship, which typically immediately results in both butterflies shooting upwards more than 200 meters till they're lost in sight. And what happens then 
nobody knows. No one knows where they go. So ArcelorMittal have fitted, have paid for little radio transmitters to be fitted to a male or males so that the biology can be understood much more thoroughly. Um, I do need to get an update on that because this was six years ago, five, six years ago. Um, but the butterfly is also fascinating in that it is unusual for one of the swallowtails in that it is incredibly toxic. It contains um, cardiac glycosides sufficient in one butterfly to kill five cats. And so the assumption is that its food plant for its caterpillars is one of the Asclepias vines, which are known to be toxic. It's also an interesting footnote to say that the great African lepidopterist, Torben Larsen, never got to see Antimachus before he passed away. So a couple more from Ghana. We have a male and a female. You think we were looking at two completely different species. The male is the gaudy pillar box red specimen on the right. And the female is beautiful, but completely different shown down on the left. And there is a butterfly story attached to this in that these butterflies were both taken on my first visit to Ghana. Um, at a wonderful location known as Atewa, but a little bit like the Nimba Hills, Atewa is bauxite, which as you probably know is what aluminium is made out of. And on a recent trip, or four, only four years, um, four years later, Atewa has gone. Its trees have gone, its wildlife has gone, it's now a mining site. But there were so many butterflies flying around that uh, it was difficult to know what to focus on. And I settled on this female, uh, Kimothoe. And it flew into the, the shrubbery at the side of the track. And I followed it in with my camera, my single lens reflex to get within about nine inches of her. And as I was about to take the photograph, well, I probably had taken the photograph, I felt a, a, a prick on my midriff, which I assumed was just a thorn from the bush, until I looked down to discover that I was standing in a stream of ants and they were all over my body. And as soon as the first one bit, they all bit. And so you have this sight of me in a soaking wet t-shirt, jumping out of the way, trying to get my t-shirt off, dropping my trousers, getting my trainers off, getting my socks off, down into my underpants, as these ants were reluctant to get off. Um, my colleagues helped me <laughs> pick the ants off because you couldn't brush them off. Um, the saving grace was that, unlike a lot of um, uh, certainly Western ants and indeed fire ants in the in the tropics, there was no um, there was no burning sensation after each bite. I was just a pin cushion for countless ants for for far too long. So in the end, everybody on the trip got anted. And although it's not a pleasant thing to experience, it's an incredibly funny spectator sport. <laughs> and here again, a couple of different um, um, gender differences, the female and the male, Euphedra Medon. Um, there are so many butterflies, certainly in, in Africa, that 
are, are so completely different. Um, it, it's not just true of Africa. It, it, it's, it, it happens just generally. But again, when you're in a new country, you've got to you've got to learn the butterflies and learn when you look at two butterflies like this that you're actually looking at a male and female of the same species. Uh, wrong way. And the Euphedra family, there are many Euphedra in Africa and they're all wonderful forest butterflies. And I just selected one more from Ghana, uh, the, uh, the Hebe's pink forester, Euphedra Hebe's. Um, just an absolutely stunning butterfly. Um, just, just wonderful to see. And I know exactly where that was taken. I can visualize, I can visualize the track, exactly where it was. I could go back there tomorrow. <laughs> so there are roughly 1500 butterfly species in West Africa and a similar number to, to India. But Peru has three times as many. Peru has 25% of the world's known butterflies. So in showing some butterflies from Peru, the question for me was, well, where do I start? So I decided that I would start small. Uh, these butterflies um, are all very small. So number one, uh, Simachia probator is probably not much more than one and a half centimeters from wingtip to wingtip. And there's a lovely little butterfly. Sometimes you, it can be mistaken for a, a large fly. And the Calidna punctata number two, um, it, it, it has a, um, uh, a, a sort of common name of the uh, starry night, and you can see why. Number three, the anteros. There are several of these anteros. This little one looks as if it has um, three dimensional golden spots on it. Um, and they have these fantastic furry legs. All the anteros have got incredibly furry legs. And Rhetus Dysoni, uh, there are two or three Rhetus, um, and they're all similar in the sense that they're uh, dark blue, pale blue stripes and with pink on. Um, just wonderful butterflies, a common butterfly, all the same. So getting a little bit larger, we have the first uh, um, example. Um, this is a sort of medium-sized butterfly of the Lycaenid family. Um, wonderful falcate forewing, beautiful turquoise um, blue upper side. Um, <clears throat> not a, a, an uncommon butterfly, but one that you don't often see. The calic The calicors, um, sorry, I, I've just been told my battery's running low, but I don't see why, because it's plugged into the mains. But uh, anyway, um, the calicors, um, uh, there are man, many different uh, examples of that, as indeed there are for the two at the bottom, the skippers. These butterflies are probably sort of three centimeters, three and a bit centimeters, wingtip to wingtip. Uh, fantastic iridescence, particularly on the Yangunas. Um, it's always a, a big shout out when you see a Yanguna. I'm getting slightly bigger now. We're looking at butterflies, probably four to five uh, centimeters wingspan. The Karadis, uh, a woodland butterfly here out on a rock, and unusual with its wings open, hence the shot. 
and the Pirella um, is a butterfly that skulks around in the woods, deep in the woods, flies slow and close to the ground. Um, if you believed in fairies, you might actually think you were looking at one. Um, wonderful butterflies. The Memphis are a member of the Caraxes family of uh, genus. Um, again, big butterflies with attitude. Um, the fountain here are also in the same genus um, and have these wonderful pinky purple upper sides. But you can't leave Peru uh, without a couple of uh, stunning butterflies. This first one, the Propona claudina. I think the Propona, or a, they used to be called Ag Agrias until the um, taxonomist changed the name for some reason. But this is just truly one of the astounding butterflies of the world. And this too has attitude. This too will come and check you out. It'll sit on you. It'll fly around your head. It'll harass you. It'll sit on a leaf looking at you. Um, but absolutely stunning. Um, I think probably I might be describing my favorite Peruvian butterfly. But one can't talk about Peru and Latin America and Amazonia without talking about the morphos. This is Morpho retina, uh, retinol, um, photographed um, in, in Peru. Um, a big butterfly, you get some sense of the size of it by the on, on the larger picture by the smaller or medium-sized butterfly to its left. And you get a sense of the absolutely dazzling iridescence uh, from the upper side on, on this male. The photo on the left shows one tucking into some banana. You, did, you got muted. Peter, please unmute. Okay, I've unmuted. Unmuted? Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. I don't know why that keeps happening, uh, but I'm nearly there. In fact, okay, I can't get to my last slide now for some reason. Okay, well, look, um, not only am I now unmuted, but um, I'm not able to show you the very last slide for some very strange reason. But my last slide said thank you to everybody uh, for listening. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, if you wish to um, browse my butterfly collection, uh, you can do it on, on my website, which is www lepidigi.net I think that's on the um, on the advert I can see Pam at the bottom right there hello Pam so with that I am done although for some reason as I say I can't get the last photo up and I've lasted just about an hour which is a miracle <laughs> <laughs> absolutely on time so Orko is there any question Sir, there is uh, one from in the Facebook. Uh, just one question. Yeah. Yes, uh, it says uh, Ashish Bias asks why butterfly migrate. Please share a info about local migration. So, Peter, do you have any info on local migration? Migration in well, your place. Uh, um, yeah, I guess the, the main migration we have in, 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 in Great Britain is the painted lady, uh, Vanessa Cardui, which travels up in varying numbers each year from the, uh, um, from the Sahara, the southern edge of the Atlas Mountains in Morocco, 
and it travels north across the Mediterranean into Spain, into France, travels north, crosses the English Channel into England. And the reason for that is that the food plant on which the, the butterflies, caterpillars feed, is the common thistle. And as the summer heats up, so the thistles flower and fade and wither and become um, no good as food plants for the caterpillars. So the butterflies keep pushing north to find fresh food plant. And my understanding is that probably that is the driving force behind the vast majority, if not all, of butterfly migrations. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not a scientist. I'm just, a, yeah. just an That's, amateur. So perhaps Arjan could elaborate. No, this is one of the main reasons for oh. migration, following the fresh food plant in yeah. you know in search for fresh food plant during the winter months or during the summer months so thank you peter it's a wonderful wonderful presentation so many good memories refreshed indeed uh, i must say something bam yeah. <laughs> so so many good memories peter thank you yeah so many, so many places i recognize so many butterflies uh, so many stories. We're all fairly close together. Well, every time I think about the um, the elephant at Jaipur, <laughs> I also know how absolutely nonchalant you were. So <laughs> cool. <laughs> so cool. So we have such good memories. Thanks again, Peter, uh, uh, for sorry, sharing uh, all this. Uh, there is one more question. Is there okay. any insectivorous butterflies? Ristik Nondi asks. Sorry, I missed the start of that. In uh, is there any insectivorous butterflies? Uh, butterflies feeding on insects uh, such? Yes, there are. Um, yeah, there are. Um, uh, in the um, Lycaenid family, there are many species whose caterpillars will feed on the larvae of different species of ant. So the, the caterpillars of the butterfly exude a like a, a drop of honeydew which the ants love and so they milk the caterpillars and in return the caterpillars just tuck, tuck in to the larvae of the ants. So they spend their lives in the ant's nest until they are ready to hatch as, as a butterfly. And they're left alone by the ants as they make their way up into the daylight. Uh, there's a real symbiosis. Um, in many, many of the Lycaenid species. Um, I'm trying to... Yeah, actually, yes, you've got them in India, don't you? You have the ape fly. Yeah, yeah ape fly is one of the butterfly which yeah. feeds on aphid, the larva, larvae of it. Yeah, yeah. So the and answer to the question is yes. <laughs> so any 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 questions, Alko? Yes, uh, there is another question. Arunava Mukherjee asks. Uh, are there uh, common? Uh, are there any natural sources for pigmentation? Right, uh, like uh, are there uh, like how do they pigment themselves like such uh, beautiful colors? I I, I have to say that um, I, I I don't know the answer to that question. It, it's a bit uh, on the technical side for me. Uh, I know there's a lot of work is done on pigmentation. Um, and it's also true that butterflies see in the ultraviolet uh, spectrum, which is not the one that we see them in. Uh, so they probably look completely different, butterfly to butterfly. Um, but I, I, I don't know anything, um, if you like, useful on pigmentation. Okay. So yes, there are certain food habits that enables them to get their pigmentation and also the light 
and many other things. So anyhow, Peter, this is a wonderful session, and okay, we are okay. about to end it. Thanks, Thanks for like sharing you. all your all your experiences with us. Thanks for sharing all those good memories. It's so so good to hear from you. Okay, and we will we will do it again one day, Arjun. I'm Pat. Yeah. 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 Yeah, 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 definitely, <laughs> definitely. Yeah, Peter, so somebody up. somebody asked if you would put up the um, your website on the chat. Yeah, well, it's actually on my last slide, but for that some reason, didn't come up. it's not coming up. No, it's completely un unresponsive. Okay, you know, so I, I, I actually wrote that in the chat box. Okay. It's lepidigi.net. Yes. L-E-P-I-D-I-G-I -I -I dot net, N-E-T. That's it. Good. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the opportunity, Arjan, and stay no, safe. It's, it's, it's my pleasure. It's, all of us from Nature Myths enjoyed it a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Okay. So thank you everyone for joining. Uh,